Welcome to Searching the Scriptures. Our Bible teacher will be Gunther von Haringa Sr. In this series of studies, we will be focusing on the Book of Judges. So without further ado, let's look into God's Word, the Bible. Good evening and welcome to Searching the Scriptures. This is part 29 of chapter 3 in the book of Judges. And today's date is March 17th, 2017. I'll read verses 21 to 25 of this historical parable. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw out, excuse me, so he could not draw the dagger out of his belly and the dirt came out. Then Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. When he was gone out, his servants came, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked, they said, Surely he covereth his feet in his summer chamber. And they tarried till they were ashamed, and behold, he opened not the doors of the parlor. Therefore they took a key and opened them, and behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. We are looking at the last couple of uh, words in verse 24 before we move on to verse 25, and these are in his summer chamber. In his summer is Strong's number 4747, and chamber is 2315. We visited the term. 4747 in his summer in verse 20, as it only appears in these two verses. Actually, it stems from a root word, which is Strong's number 7119, which helps to clarify, at least in the historical context, what is implied by summer, a cold or cool place to refresh oneself. And it only appears in the following three references. In Proverbs 17.27, it is translated as, is of an excellent spirit, in conjunction with another term, which is 33.68, which is commonly rendered as precious or costly. He that hath knowledge spareth his words and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. In Proverbs 25, 25, it's rendered as the word as cold. Uh, there we read, as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. And in Jeremiah 18, 14, there we, we read, Will a man leave the snow of Lebanon, which cometh from the rock of the field, or shall the cold, this is how this is translated, or shall the cold flowing waters that come from another place be forsaken? Now, spiritually, we understand that these last two verses speak of cold waters which portray the refreshing water of life that was so plentiful and abundant during the latter rain. You might also recall in part 27 when we were investigating the phrase streams from Lebanon in Song of Solomon 415, streams from Lebanon was one of three descriptions of the Bride of Christ in that verse. And we also considered verse 14 of Jeremiah 18, 1 through 17, or shall the cold flowing waters, which again typify the wonderful 
water of life. Uh, here or in that verse in Jeremiah 18, 14, or shall the cold, is this uh, word Strong's number 71, 19. Now, on the other hand, in Proverbs 17, 27, 71, 19 is translated is of an excellent spirit, referring to an individual who hath knowledge, and that would be knowledge of the Word of God, and a man of understanding. Again, this would be understanding of the Word of God pointing to a true believer. The first part of this compound Hebrew word is Strong's number 3368, which I mentioned earlier is more commonly rendered as costly or precious. And it relates to the priceless nature of God's redemption, as we read, for example, in Isaiah 28:16, where it appears as precious. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now, needless to say, we are concerned with the spiritual meaning of summer, which we have understood to be related to harvest time, which denotes in particular the time and season known as the latter rain. This period of time extended from 1994 to 2011 and witnessed the greatest influx of elect into the kingdom of God prior to the closing of the door of salvation on May 21, 2011. It also coincides with the time frame leading up to the death of Eglon. And Eglon, we know, exemplifies Satan, who was defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ on May 21, 2011. And Eglon ruled over Israel and in this context, Israel is referring spiritually to the institutional churches and denominations of our day that came under the wrath of God. Eglon ruled over them, if you recall, uh, earlier in this chapter for 18 years. And I pointed out in part 14 that the historical parable in Luke 13, 10 through 17 gives us much spiritual insight into these 18 years, which does not appear anywhere else in the Bible except in Judges 10, in which God allowed in a similar fashion the Philistines and Ammonites to rule over Israel for 18 years. But here in Luke 13, 10 through 17, we find some interesting association uh, that God makes with this word. A and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed. And all the people rejoiced 
for all the glorious things that were done by him. What is noteworthy, among other things, in this historical parable is that God is associating 18 years with whom Satan hath bound, as God allowed the Moabites, who again spiritually represent the end time institutional churches and denominations that have come under the judgment of God to afflict Israel. There's another aspect regarding summer that I'd like to elaborate on concerning two types of weapons or instruments. One is the two-edged word of God, as we read about in Hebrews 4.12, or the sword of the Spirit in Ephesians 6.17, which has always been the means that God employed during the day of salvation. Secondly, during our current day of judgment, there is another kind of harvest taking place since May 21, 2011, which involves a different instrument, a sickle, an instrument with one blade, as we read in Revelation 14, 18 through 20. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without or outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. By the way, in Judges 3, 24, there is a different word that God uses in place of summer parlor. A parlor is 5944, and uh, it's found in, uh, in Judges 3, 20, it's, um, it's a, wait, I'm sorry, it's the other way around, let's see. Let me double check that. Uh, yeah, what it is is uh, in Judges 3.20, there's summer parlor. But in Judges 3.24, it's a summer chamber. The word summer is the same in both. The difference has to do with parlor, which is 59.44, and chamber, which is 23.15. And we can ask the question, why does God make this kind of distinction by using two different words to describe the same place? In part 20, we considered some of the ways that God uses this term parlor, which surfaces four times in Judges 3. It's also rendered as chamber 12 times, going up twice, ascent once and once as loft for a total of 20 times. The following are some of the ways that God utilizes this word both in a positive sense as well as in a negative sense as we will you will see shortly. With regard to the divine blueprints of the temple, for example, which God had given to David, and David in turn relayed these to his son Solomon in order to build the temple, we read in 1 Chronicles 28, 11, Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof and of the treasuries thereof, and of the upper chambers. Thereof and and of the upper chambers is this term for parlor, 5944. And of the treasuries thereof, and of the upper chambers thereof, and of the inner parlors thereof, and of the place of the mercy seat. So these are blueprints having to do with these various uh, structural elements of the building of the temple itself. 
Uh, in 2 Kings 23, 12, however, God employs this word in the context of judgment, which once again foreshadows the end of the institutional churches and denominations. And this has to do with good King Josiah's zeal to obey and uphold the word of God. And the altars that were on the top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of Jehovah, did the king beat down and break them down from thence and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. Also in Jeremiah 22, 1 through 9 and 13 through 17, uh, we find uh, these, this term, a parlor or chambers, uh, in verse 13 and also in verse 14. But I'll read the context because, again, this has to do with the, the end of the church age. Thus saith Jehovah, go down, speaking to Jeremiah, go down to the house of the king of Judah and speak there this word and say, hear the word of Jehovah, O king of Judah, that sittest upon the throne of David, thou and thy servants and thy people that enter in by these gates. Thus saith Jehovah, execute ye judgment and righteousness and deliver the spoil out of the hand of the oppressor. And do no wrong, do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. For if ye do this thing indeed, then shall there enter in by the gates of this house kings, sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, he and his servants and his people. But if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, saith Jehovah, that this house shall become a desolation. For thus saith Jehovah unto the king's house of Judah, Thou art Gilead unto me, and the head of Lebanon, yet surely I will make thee a wilderness and cities which are not inhabited. And I will prepare destroyers against thee, every one with his weapons. And they shall cut down thy choice cedars and cast them into the fire. And many nations shall pass by this city, and they shall say every man to his neighbor, Wherefore hath Jehovah done thus unto this great city? Then they shall answer, because they have forsaken the covenant of Jehovah their God and worshiped other gods and served them. And then verse 13, Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by wrong, that useth his neighbor's service without wages and giveth him not for his work that saith, I will build me a wide house and large chambers, and cutteth him out windows, and it is sealed with cedar and painted with vermilion. Shalt thou reign, because thou closest thyself in cedar? Did not thy father eat and drink and do judgment and justice, and then it was well with him? He judged the cause of the poor and needy, then it was well with him. Was not this to know me, saith Jehovah? But thine eyes and thine heart are not but for thy covetousness and for to shed innocent blood and for oppression and for violence to do it. First Kings 17, 19 and 23 also recounts the historical parable of the widow woman typifying the unsaved elect. Like I just read uh, a little while ago in the, in the Jeremiah uh, 22 verse where it talks about the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. 
those are spiritual terms having to do with the elect that were not saved yet during the day of salvation. Here we find this widow woman and her son that Elijah had ministered to. And uh, this word is translated in uh, verse 19 as into a loft. And then in verse 23, out of the chamber. Uh, in the historical context, the, uh, the son is sick uh, uh, to death and, 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 he, and he's healed by Elijah. And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft, where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. Uh, then in verse 23, And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. So we have the idea of death and resurrection here. Again, a beautiful picture of the gospel. In 2 Chronicles 9, 4, we have the record of the profound impression that Solomon, a picture of Christ, made upon the queen of Sheba, who typifies the elect, in which this term is rendered and his ascent. And the meat of his table, this is Solomon's table, and the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers and their apparel, his cupbearers also and their apparel, and his ascent by which he went up into the house of Jehovah. There was no more spirit in her. Uh, also, if we go to Psalm 104, uh, verses 3 and 13, we find this declaration speaking of God who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds, uh, representing the, the judgment of the word of God, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh, af, who walk, excuse me, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. He watereth the hills from his chambers, the earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. So we see uh, in these passages, the thrust of these verses highlight both the positive as well as the negative spiritual aspects of the Great Tribulation, typified by the 18-year rule of Eglon, again a picture of Satan over Israel, having to do with the corporate churches because God installed as of May 21, 1988 to rule there. Now during the actual 23 years or 8,400 days of the Great Tribulation, two dominant and opposing forces were engaged. One, unparalleled worldwide deception. And number two, the greatest gospel penetration the world had ever seen and would never see again. Well, it looks like we'll have to stop here today. Lord willing, we'll take a look at this other term, chamber, uh, Strong's number 2315, in our next study. Thank you for joining us today for Searching the Scriptures. Until next time, to God be the glory.